Moving Out has become one of this season's biggest hits on Broadway. We have with us the woman who is the muscle behind that show and also happens to be one of the modern dance's most eminent creative forces. Here to introduce her, my co-host Michael Riedel of the New York Post. I am very happy to have with us tonight Twyla Tharp who has given us a um, exciting, dazzling and very, very moving musical, dance musical, ballet, she can define it for us. Uh, in Moving Out, which uh, uses her, her choreography set to the music of Billy Joel. Big hit on Broadway and a uh, big contender, I think, for Tony's this year. Twyla Tharp, welcome to Theatre Talk. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. I'm curious to know why you decided um, Moving Out should be on Broadway and not uh, in dance hall or where you uh, normally work. Because we wanted to reach a much broader audience than uh, what ordinarily attends dance concerts mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it uh, needed to address concerns that were broader based than ordinarily uh, what a modern dance company might feel is their provenance, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I wanted to do a narrative. I wanted to do a narrative that would have an emotional impact. It had to be a full evening's work. I knew that it was going to need production components that, frankly, modern dance doesn't afford, mm -hmm. uh, and that it could reach into the mainstream, I believed, in a way that modern dance does not. And is this, when you were first thinking of the idea, uh, did it's, this idea say to you, it needs to be on a bigger stage? It, not it only the size itself. of the stage, literally. Yeah. It's the, the ambiance of the theater, the expectations the audience have when they walk in the door. When an audience walks in the door uh, to watch a modern dance concert, they have a certain mindset. Mm -hmm. When they go in a door to see a theatrical event, where the ultimate experience traditionally is catharsis, it's a totally different responsibility that you bear as the performer, as the artist. Uh, it was that I was going for. Well, one of the things that you um, have struggled with in putting this show together was telling the audience what it is. Um, it may be unfair to ask you to define it, but it has been called a musical, a ballet, a pop ballet, a dancical, all those things. What do you think of it? Yes, as? I think it's as fair to ask me as anybody else what it <laughs> is, but uh, perhaps an equal burden. Uh, I don't think of it as any of those things. I think of it as a thing. I mean, one of the challenges with this was to formulate the genre. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not dance, it's not opera, it's not straight drama. It's not poetry, it's not recital, it's not vaudeville, it's not a review. And yet it has elements of all of those but things. But it has elements ways. of all of these things. It comes closest to being a film mm -hmm. uh, and an opera. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could, if we could m more often read literally language for movement, I would think of it very much as an opera. Interesting you say that. I thought about that too. Um, and we should say that the, the, the show follows a group of friends uh, from their high school days in the early 60s through tumultuous experiences in Vietnam, um, um, their struggle with drugs and alcohol in the 70s, finding out who they are, and a kind of acceptance of themselves and, and whom they love uh, and life ultimately in the, in the 80s. And it struck me when I saw La Boheme, uh, thinking of uh, moving out, because you, as in Boheme, you have sort of stock characters of the bohemian life. And in a way, you have sort of the stock characters of the Billy Joel canon. Yet Puccini gives it that emotional re resonance with gorgeous music. You bring the emotional depth to these characters, flesh them out more through dance. Is that a fair parallel to draw between opera and what you've done? Yes, but I think it's even more important not to think of it from a craft point of view, mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as you are describing, but to go to content. Uh, and my intention was to develop a narrative that could deal with one of my favorite subjects, which is the return, or the simple one, four letter word, home. Mm. Uh, and that it would present exactly the plot that you have described with character arcs, but that has a resolution to it that says in these times of grave uncertainty uh, that we can still hold fast to the notion that we will get home. Mm. Why um, did you choose Billy Joel's music? 
Billy has a visceral, she used the word muscle, I'd use the word motor. He has, he has a compelling dynamic to his music. Number one, he never abandons it. Uh, he has a storyteller's eye. Mm -hmm. uh, he does very, not very vivid, uh, but he does extremely potent pictures of individuals, if you will, who also can become classes. Uh, the Angry Young Man and uh, from uh, Goodnight Saigon, the Vietnam Vet. Those are, those are literal portraits. He knew those people. He mm -hmm. drew those songs from real moments. Uh, from the title song, Moving Out, Anthony, mm -hmm. that person's desperation in a place where he was stagnating and his need to move out of there. Brendan Eddy, the, the disengaging of a couple who have seemed to have our fantasy world at their fingertips and suddenly oh, it's gone. Yeah. What's happened here? He doesn't tell action, he tells characters. So he gave me extremely dynamic pictures to push into action. When you are, can you give us a sense of when you're working in the dance studio or in rehearsal and creating a moment, a piece of choreography, how, how you actually do it, how Twyla Tharp works on this project? Uh, it started long before I get into the studio uh, because that moment has to work on many levels. It has to work as dance, pure and simple. You have to be compelled by those dancers in a way that says nobody else could ever do this at any other moment in time. Just on a dance level, it has to give us that. Uh, in this case, uh, as a narrative, it has to make the moment that is developing out of the previous go into the next one along the spine in a succinct and economical fashion. It's got to get you narratively from point A to point C at the same time as it's dynamically driven by the movement. And it has to work musically. Mm. Uh, the musical score has to have also a construct that has an arc to it, that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it keeps driving it to this resolution. The tall order. <laughs> Sorry, that's the job. <laughs> it's why it's been difficult birthing, if yes. I might say. Well, we'll get to that in a minute, but I just, I'm just curious. Do we though. have to? Yeah, yeah, yeah we got to address that issue. Let it go. I won't let that go. But, uh, I, but I'm just curious to know, do you conceive the movement in your head first, or do you look at the dancers in front of you and shape it from them? Okay, let's get real here, okay? Let's not be romantic. Uh, the core group of dancers in this had been touring with me for the last two years plus. Mm. Uh, several of them in that group I'd been working with for more than a decade. Mm. Uh, and they're very special people to me, and I know them very, very well. I know what they do. I know, in my opinion, what they do better than anybody else in the world does, and that's where I want to show them. Uh, like the Marx Brothers, they didn't put shtick up there overnight. It was out on the road for decades, and then the shtick appeared. Uh, we've had this stuff, some of the material, not a lot of it is lifted directly. But what they do, I mean, for example, John, no way. John Salia. Would get through this show if he hadn't endured two years of traveling with Surfer on the River Sticks, which was a lot harder than this to get through. <laughs> So, uh, I, I, right, so you've all been working together for all, for all these years. Um, but specific It's a repertory theater in that sense. Right, right. But for specific movements when you choreo choreograph, are you, uh, you know, in the studio by yourself in front of a mirror moving? Is that how you do it? How, how, how do you choreograph something? I, I, don't, I can't conceive of it since I can't dance. There are many ways <laughs> of doing this, okay? First of all, I pull my glasses down because I am legally blind, which means I really can't see the mirror when I dance. So it comes from how you feel. What is the feeling of the thing? Okay, so it literally comes from the inside. Then you must project yourself to the outside and you must look at it and you can say, okay, fine, that feels great, but you know what? Looks like nothing. So get over it. So make what you're feeling register visually, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a discipline. It's a training. You learn to do these things. Mm -hmm. uh, the difficult birthing process of moving out. Um, Can we talk more about the artistic uh, <laughs> waves and whimps of this? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Twyla. Um, the hard-hitting show here. Um, no secret that uh, moving out opened in Chicago to less than enthusiastic notices. Um, where had you gone off track in Chicago? 
I hadn't gone on track. I was right on track. The only problem is the track wasn't going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there was a, a concept here that uh, this project was actually grounded in that proved false with an audience. Okay. That concept was we can sit here and listen to Billy's lyrics and project it onto what we are seeing. That was the concept. All right. We get to an audience, and the audience is going like this. I'll give you a demonstration of how the audience is watching our show, okay? The audience is going... <laughs> <laughs> now, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> They're taking... The and I'm going, uh, yeah, I think we have a fundamental flaw <laughs> in how, how we're you operating. That? And this means that they can't take all these things in at once, that they take in a bit of the lyric sometimes, looking it, at the it dance? It means they don't know how to get their information. They don't know, am I getting my story from here? Am I getting my story right. from here? Who's telling my story? Now, fortunately, by the time we got to the second act already in New York, when this was the concept of the thing, I had discarded that idea and just gone to what I know, which is telling story and movement. But the first half of the show was predicated on introducing characters right. and giving some of the kind of plot information that language can give that movement doesn't do. We operate on a different level. We operate on a much earlier level, uh, literally earlier level. I mean, uh, one of the saving graces in Chicago was I continued to subscribe, yes, I'll say it, to the New York Times. Uh, and there was a piece in the Times that uh, indicated that language was an unbelievably recent development in the human evolution that in fact it was only like uh, three times older than Gil Gilgamesh that we'd started <laughs> speaking and before that was communication was through action and through watching how people move which is what I say when I uh, which is what I mean when I say that we are much older and the stories that we tell in a way are simpler but they're also more basic than what is introduced with language which can bring in Lies. Movement does not lie. Movement, really, forgive me for saying this, can only tell the truth. Hmm. So, uh, interesting. So, but, but, second act, I'd already figured this out, okay? First act, I was still going along with what Billy thought the show was, what the producers thought the show was, what everybody thought the show right. was, which was, in a way, an illustration of Billy's lyrics, and that we could count on Billy's lyrics to carry the, the content, and we would work around that uh, as a satellite with the movement in the first act. But you okay. couldn't count on the lyrics to carry it in the... Second act, I didn't have to already. I'd gotten right. there, I'd gotten there. I I'd, I'd made enough introduction uh, so that second act, it was out. Now we do it how we do it on our own terms. But first act, I was still working with this crosshatch mm. of information until this kind of thing is going on. And then I'm saying, okay, let's get real here. We have to tell the story visually. So I completely redirected uh, uh, where the focus was, uh, redirected how the action operated. Same story is told. Same characters are there. Look, we had a great party in the second act. They were wearing the wrong clothes in the first act to go to the party, get their clothes right. That's what the first act became, uh, was readdressing issues literally like wardrobe uh, and so forth. So that, how did I know when it worked? How did you know? I turned off the sound. And if the story came visually all the way, I was working. Simple. I saw the show in Chicago, and I'm just astounded by the, the, the turnaround that you did with it. One of the things that I saw you getting away from mm -hmm. uh, was in Chicago, there was a more literalness to, to the dancing. If Anthony was working in the grocery store, he was actually stacking shelves. That was pretty much gone by the time you got to, to right. New York. What was the reason to change all that? Uh, I, as I said, I no longer had to connect into, I no longer felt the responsibility to connect into Billy's language. Mm -hmm. I told the same story in a different way than mm -hmm. he was doing it. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to tell exactly the same details of the story he was doing. Right. And I think in some ways you get at a deeper, a, a richer characterization when they're doing movement that is not so linked, to, mm -hmm. pegged to the lyrics. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's less restraining <laughs> for me. Yeah. Um, how, when you are out of town, and you have a line of nervous producers with a lot of money on the line. You have an array of negative reviews in front of you. You have people whispering opinions about things in your ears, sometimes behind your back. How do you keep all that at bay and continue to do your work? Because I've seen a lot of directors get crushed by Lose it. Lose their of town. center, yeah. 
You make sure you're in the gym every day at 6.30. <laughs> That's it. Uh, you don't lose your own stability, uh, and you stay grounded, mm -hmm. uh, and you maintain your physical stamina. I have a lot of stamina. I've worked at um, developing this, uh, and I know that under conditions of heavy stress, this is the first thing that slips away. And once you lose that, you're, you're sunk. Because what I really had to do with the show, I mean, intellectually, yeah, you can figure this all out pretty quickly. What you have to do is maintain morale. You have to keep the cast up. You have to keep them together. They're traumatized. Uh, and you have to give them hope. Uh, and if you're not in some kind of condition that says, all right, okay, this is like it's a bramble, uh, it's a detour, now come on, we're going around here, we're going here, and they go, oh, okay, we're going over there, then they'll let this go. But if you're going, eh, I think we're going, eh, and they're going, oh, God, no confidence what in the have leader. we gotten ourselves into? <laughs> and we all go home now. <laughs> um, you and I had an interesting lunch not too long ago, and one of the people you brought up as sort of your your secret collaborator on this show was Jerome Robbins. Well, Jerry, it continues to be an old friend. Uh, and um, uh, Jerry obviously was a great director. Uh, mm -hmm. And he had a way of cutting to the chase. Mm -hmm. So there would be moments when I would look at the stage and I would say, yeah, this is a hodgepodge. This is a mess. And then I'd say, OK. Uh, this is Jerry sitting here, and he's going, why are they talking? Haven't we had this conversation before? I'm going, well, Jerry, it's because he's saying, shut up, don't have them talk. I'm saying, okay, all right, all right, they won't talk this time, next time, okay? Well, this was a debate you often had with him, that we should dan can debate. you do dance right. with people talking in it, which you originally conceived of moving out, having Correct. some dialogue. So did it yeah. have dialogue it in Chicago? It did in Chicago. Mm. And you tried that, and Jerry said... And Jerry said, I've told you before, I'll tell you again, this is never going to work. So I told the kids, okay, guys, this is never going to work uh, this time. Uh, and so, you know why? Because angels are silent. And they went, ooh, angels are silent. That's a good one. You got us there because they <laughs> love to talk and they're very good actors. Yeah, sure, sure. And they realize that speaking is a tool of communication. And I just taken away a big one from them. Mm-hmm. But the challenge is even greater than to convey the character through. The challenge movement. is even greater, and it becomes more magic, because when you see people communicating physically, in truth, something in front of your eyes that is impossible, you go, wow. Yeah, yeah. You had been on Broadway once before. Many times before. Well, Singing in the Rain is the one that I... I've had shows on Broadway, the Catherine Wheel, uh, uh, and yeah. we've, had, we've had limited engagements. Right, before. right. But your other attempt at a commercial musical, Sing in the Rain, did not go very well. Did that... It did not go badly. The rumor <laughs> and the myth is that it didn't go very well because it didn't go as well as everyone would have fantasized it should go. It paid back its investment. It ran for a year here in New York. It went out on the road and it sent me checks for the next 10 years. <laughs> well, so, uh, you know, it was okay. a smash. <laughs> it was not a smash, uh, which was the problem. No, the problem was that it actually was the first of all the revivals. And uh, on Broadway, if you go back and check your history here, it was an early one of the current siege of revivals. Mm -hmm. uh, and people didn't know how to address this because the Broadway theater was originality. It was about original material. Also, uh, the authors wanted exactly the script that was in the film. They did not want it addressed in any way at all. Uh, for the adaptation. That was a part of the deal. Uh, so people looked at it and they saw the movie, but they didn't see Gene Kelly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did that experience put you off Broadway where authors and other people have so much control? Or from that, did you realize, if I'm going to do Broadway again, I it's going to be it, my yeah. entire vision, there my show? Go. One has to become the auteur. And that's what moving out is really about. Well, did you have any struggles while while the transition of moving out was, was happening with people trying to tell you what to do? Oh, yes, of course. But uh, you have always to listen to this information and you have like, it's like the wheat and the, you know, the kernels go down and you keep the husk on the top. So everybody is coming from their, from their point of view. Everyone wants something for their piece of information. You have to go, okay, that's where they're coming from. I don't need that. But the piece of information is useful. Mm -hmm.
I was amazed also that uh, a lot of people don't want to look at negative reviews, but you you said bring them on. Information them. is information. Uh, and, uh, you know, frequently your friends will tell you what they think you want to hear, and your enemies will just go ahead and say the what truth. they see. Uh, I'm not saying critics are enemies. I would never go there. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> look, critics are intelligent people. They have a lot of uh, context, uh, and uh, that's why they're valuable. And it, it's nuts to not utilize mm. their information. I was educated in art history, which means that it's not just about the product, if you will. It's the history of the criticism of that product. Exactly. Works, and, yeah. and you learn about what that is by looking at it critically and seeing how it's evolved, where it came from, and what it led to. Mm -hmm. And this is the bigger perspective that criticism can give. And even though many of these reviews didn't give it to me, I pretended like they did. Mm -hmm. And I came from their point of view just because they were there like, you know, you can sit in a studio and you can say, okay, now I'm the audience, fine. You can sit in a studio and say, now I'm the critic, fine. And I do those things. It's not the same as having a real audience and real critics. So in this case, actually, I was blessed with a second chance. You don't get it very often. No. How are Billy Joel's theatrical instincts? Newcomer to the Broadway world? Uh, Billy, uh, as I said, he tends to think um, as, as a short story writer, not as a novel writer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so his perceptions were, again, in the arena where he's strong character. He'd look at the opening and he'd say, Brenda is not sympathetic. I don't want to take her home. I'm saying, well, Billy, I'm really sorry about that, but okay. And I'm going, yeah, he's right. You don't love Brenda. I better fix this. <laughs> so then, there, then there's the part about James, all right? I've had James die 16 different ways, all right? It goes up. I know it's a problem. He's going, did James die? I'm going, Billy, James has died already 17 different ways, haven't you? And he says, I didn't know. <laughs> well, that's very useful Billy information. Billy doesn't know James died. This is like the critical <laughs> plot point of the first act. <laughs> oh, my God. Get to work. Do it for number 1900. You know, <laughs> but you want, whatever. The one you wound up with is The is, one we wound really up with, moving. I'm very pleased with. And it's very simple, but very, very, very simple, but it had to go through all of those horrible missteps to get there. Yeah. Uh, because what it had in the first drafts was conflict. And what it has is in, finally, its last resolution is a very simple statement, but with a lot of tenderness between the two men, which I had to find in harsh ways. Mm. Yeah, it, it is a beautiful moment. You uh, have a minute. Well, all right, one minute left. The toast of Broadway now. Do you want to do more Broadway shows? And can you see yourself doing a more traditional kind of musical, a book musical, for example, where you actually have to deal with <laughs> other writers? And you know, in showbiz, we never say never. So you'd, you'd be open to that? I'm open. I'm open, man. I'm open. Would you tackle another revival? I mean another revival. I mean, wait, like, like singing, singing right? taking an old under, show and sure, thinking it in a new way? Sure, but not under those conditions. I mean, it would, they'd, it would have to be given to serious rewrite if it were a film. Mm. And you're doing a book, too? I'm doing a book, The Creative Habit, Simon & Schuster. I'm only like 18 months behind my deadline, so <laughs> it will be <laughs> out soon. They must understand that since you had this musical to get out. Yeah, they try. Do you ever take a vacation, or are you just uh, working? I'm talking your life? about taking a vacation, okay? I'm talking about it <laughs> soon. <laughs> but see, if you took it, could you possibly stop? <laughs> oh, could I you just, loll around on the beach? No, or? no I no. just construct the framework for the next 10 years while I was there, <laughs> which is fine. It's well, good investment of time. And indeed, and the payoff is not only for you, but also for uh, the audience who's going to move in out, which is a terrific show. Thank you. At the uh, Richard Rogers Theater. Right. Twyla Tharp, it's been great to have you. Thanks a lot Thank for being you. our guest. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. And so we will close now by taking another look at Twyla Tharp and Billy Joel's. Am I allowed to say and Billy Joel's? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. Well, pretty much. For, for the sake <laughs> We're amongst of, friends. Yeah, for the sake of this show. All right. <laughs> Moving out. Good night.